Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul. During this live stream we were watching the SpaceX Crew Dragon Demo 2 mission returning from the International Space Station, in this case doing the re-entry and splashdown. And at that point I was working on the Mercury missions and trying to get them to Mercury still with their ion engine burns and all that business. I've cut out as much of that as possible. It was very tedious during the live streams and wouldn't be any more fun trying to go over them in detail right here. As you can see, the missions were still a lot of them beyond Venus orbit at their apoapsis. They've got the tangency to Mercury orbit at their periapsis, but we've got a lot of work to do to bring down those orbits. Now with the Dragon returning in real life, I decided to undock this little Dragon 2, missing its trunk for some reason from my International Space Station in the game and bring it back down as well. So it is departing. I actually forget whether there's crew on board. It looks like food, water, and oxygen is being used, so I suppose so. And it is going out there. I like this shot, but anyway, I did use the RCS to deorbit, much to the pain and suffering of my live stream audience on Twitch. And here we are. Uh, entering the atmosphere as the real capsule is actually on parachute already. Uh, so, but we can catch up to it pretty quickly. It takes a long while on parachute, you know. Uh, so they have splashed down while we are going through re-entry heat here. This bit of the original stream audio is muted because, of course, there's SpaceX commentary going on, but it'll be unmuted soon enough once the recovery of Dragon 2 is complete. Unfortunately, in the game, my Dragon 2 was setting down on land. That wasn't very realistic, not a splashdown. But, well, anyway, it's safe. And as long as it stops jittering, we can recover it. And we actually beat SpaceX on that one. <laughs> the recovery of the real thing takes a little bit of time. Next up, I decided that we would remove the supply module inside the bay of the shuttle currently docked to the ISS using tugs. I wanted to move it onto the station so the shuttle could depart without wasting the supplies. So here we are launching sort of like an Antares rocket uh, under the pa uh, shuttle pad there, unfortunately, uh, because it's so short. Anyway, but uh, it's got two NK-33 engines. I don't think I said to the AJ-26, which is the one, the version of the NK-33 that the Antares rocket actually used. But mainly it's a huge single stage that and then the bridge stage. So the bridge stage only does a little bit of the orbital burn. Most of the orbital burn is with the two NK33 engines at really high thrust to weight ratio getting us uh, to 6,000 meters per second there you can see and then the bridge stage has about 2,000 meters per second to use to finish orbit and get the tugs over to the station. So there's the little bridge stage, most of the rocket that first stage there. So not quite an SSTO but pretty close. Anyway, the bridge stage got uh, these little tugs to orbit and I made very simple rendezvous burns to get us over to the station. So here we are approaching the station, but the tugs are going to have to claw that module in the shuttle bay and bring it out and then we can dock it to the station. So here we have our tugs with the advanced grabbing unit. These are Canada tugs with extendable RCS arms and a little docking port on its tail. And there's the basically the HTV pressurized module in the bay of the shuttle. That's what I use to carry the supplies. There's another HTV just above the shuttle right there. And that's the full version of the HTV. But we decided, uh, I think we had some sort of crew thing to do as well. And that's why we use the shuttle for bringing these supplies. And so we're moving it uh, so that it can be a permanent supply module on the station but I need the other tug to help out because otherwise it's very hard to dock with just one tug on one side of that. While I was getting that tug over, uh, the module was drifting towards the station in a very dangerous way, and so I, in a panic, I tried to get this tug to get it away, and finally we can hear the audio from the live stream because the SpaceX broadcast is over. So here we go. Now we've got both tugs on and we're getting it to the docking port. And that's the Nader docking port on Unity. 
And I think that's a connection. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Could have used the canned arm, but I don't. I think it it would have been complicated because it doesn't stretch that far, and we'd have to like relocate it or do something like that. So I decided to pass on that. So now we can uh, have the shuttle depart. I moved some fuel from the HTV into it because they happen to use MH and Mon three, both of them. Uh, we also had to deorbit the Briz. That's happening right now, but. This time, when bringing the shuttle back, I decided that I would bring it back to Edwards Air Force Base, or try to. Not that I've had great success in the series bringing it back to Cape Canaveral, mind you. But bringing it back to Edwards, well, bringing it back anywhere requires some phasing. So first we have to line up properly with the general location of where we want to land. And then it's to the launch, uh, not the launch script, the re-entry script to try and bring it back. I just told the re-entry script what latitude and longitude the location was at. I made some adju uh, tentative adjustments to see if it could manage it. But, uh, well, you might guess, uh, it's not gonna have an easy time of it. So here we are during re-entry. The re-entry re heat going strong here. And it, it does try and do some rolls to get itself to the right location, but we basically overshoot. We are in California, ultimately. Well, you can see the coordinates at the bottom. I'll have to look those up uh, to see exactly where we ended up. But, yep, here we are coming down. And the good news is, because we're trying to land on the west coast, it's not going to be over water. So, we are not splashing down for once. The overheating on the OMS engine seems to just happen, and we have a touchdown. Very hard at night time, but there we are. Yeah, I don't know why the OMS engines have that thing, but they at least they don't blow up. So, yeah, we used the little drag chute and all as well. So, shuttle recovery okay, but not at the right location. Next up, I wanted to take a look at our, all of our supplies so that we could go on to the next thing. We had some time warping to do before that Saturn station node in Kerbal Alarm Clock. And this is the Saturn Station adjustment that was planned taking place. This is a mid-course adjustment with the ion engine. And we will need another adjustment to get to Saturn properly. So this mission is taking Dialer Root and Mr. Doobie over to Titan was the idea. And yep, so another maneuver will be necessary. And they've got a long trip still ahead of them. Speaking of long trips, Arthur is continuing on his way to Mercury, and this is another one of those burns. However, and I can use the iron engines while time warping, thankfully, as long as SAS is on, which is what I was doing there, but our Delta V situation doesn't seem very good, despite the ion engines. So I try and dump some of the, the other propellants that we have, especially the heavier hypergolic stuff, in an attempt to get enough delta V. And I replot here, trying to make sure that, you know, we have the right idea of how much delta V we need, how much do we need to make orbit here. So we have an encounter with 3,700 meters per second or so, and then orbit. That's to get us to a very Mercury-like orbit. And then to make orbit, you can see I'm tugging the retrograde vector for quite a while. That's another uh, well, more than a thousand anyway, and which is not what we have, at least not in the stages that are supposed to be doing this. The problem is that the top stage is a lander stage, but it doesn't have enough room for the food, water, and oxygen. So ultimately I decide to ditch the lander in order to get us enough Delta V to do the job. So we no longer have the lander with us, much to Arthur's dismay, I suppose. He did order a Mercury landing. So now I have to send another lander, among other things. We probably need to send other things, but priority was for another lander. And I decided to try a Venus flyby in order to help us get to Mercury a little bit more efficiently. And so this is me configuring the lander, and we still use the Daenerys rocket because why not? Um, why not indeed? And of course, um, big old nuclear stage too. So there it goes. For those who haven't seen it in Neris, it is an Aerospike SSTO, 
It is meant to get into orbit with about 880 tons. I originally designed it to get the uh, SpaceX Starship fully fueled into orbit, but it doesn't quite manage that. It, it can launch uh, Starship with a lot of fuel, but just not fully fueled. So off goes Daenerys and it could theoretically return, but I don't do that during this particular live stream. And those are the huge Timberwind engines that are going to push us over to Venus. A little bit of overkill in this case. Um, a little bit of overkill. Probably not, but I was using a pre-existing stage rather than trying to make a new one. After all, it had worked. So it had that going for it. So we have our little Venus periapsis and you can see I'm trying to uh, get a Mercury tangency out of it. Next up, we've got another Daenerys launch, and this time it's going the opposite direction. Miko wanted to go to Uranus, and specifically to Miranda, the moon of Uranus. And so another Daenerys launch for Miko, but the very top part you can see is much longer because we needed to give Miko lots of uh, living space. And also, those modules are USI modules with life support recyclers, which will be helpful. Uh, because the trip is going to take 20 years. That's just the trip there. Um, as far as how long Mikko waits there and ultimately takes to come back is a whole other matter. We're not using a Jupiter slingshot to Uranus because if you do that, you arrive at Uranus with a lot of excess velocity and it's harder to capture into orbit around Uranus. And what we're capturing into orbit around Uranus is fairly heavy and we can't really carry the nuclear stage with us because by then, the fuel would have boiled off. I mean, no matter how good you make that stage, you're going to end up with all of it boiling off. So so I decided to... Uh, we have Ion Engine again, so we have that. But it's fairly small and limited, so... Though at Uranus's orbit, at least we will have a lot of time to do the Ion Engine burns. That's good. But... Yeah, we want to make the arrival at Uranus as painless as possible, and then we have to get down to Miranda level, and who knows whether I've got enough Delta V for that. We will be sending many other missions to Uranus in support of Miko's mission here, uh, supply missions and uh, probably other things, uh, including more fuel so that we can make sure that Miko ends up around Miranda and maybe landing on Miranda. So anyway, here we can see the nuclear stage petering out, not quite with the Uranus burn complete. And so the rest of it has to be done with the ion engines for a long period of time. <laughs> so it's a long, long ion engine burn. You can see me time warping there and how many time warps have... Oh, I decided to use persistent rotation to keep it pointed in the same dynamic direction. And a five time warp step steps there. Yeah, that's a lot of time warping. And there we have an encounter at least, so that's good. We didn't have to do another mid-course adjustment unlike with the Saturn station. It's direct and it's pretty good. I keep burning with the ion engines and ultimately we get this sort of approach to Uranus. But you can see the number of days there. That's over 20 years. And we're carrying food, water, and oxygen for quite a long time. We've got a water recy we've got recyclers with the USI modules, so some of it is going to be replaced, but we're still carrying quite a lot. Which is why we're only sending one Kerbal. One lonely Kerbal. Well, who else could pay for it, really? Mikko has been a very dedicated viewer, <laughs> so Mikko can pay for this, but few others can. So there we go. At the top, there's a USI airlock. It's basically... Um, the quest airlock from the ISS, just in case Mikko wants to step outside and get a breather, I guess. So that is Mikko on his way. I take a look at a Mars Vessel 1, just keeping an eye on how things are going there. This is in orbit around Mars. And I also plot for further Mercury missions as necessary. So with me using Transfer Window Planner to do that, I'll wrap it up here. That was two live streams covered here, August 2nd and August 8th. And hopefully we can make more progress catching up to where we are at right now. 
With that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.